Ooh. Hi, James. Hi. I have a blanket today. You have a blanket. I have a blanket. Ethan Fry. Nobody's using it. Yeah, I feel like there's like very few people, like surprisingly. I don't yeah. know what the deal is. It's a nice blanket. It's very cozy. <laughs> Especially back there, like near the air conditioning with it blowing on you. So nice. I'm a fan. Let's see. Do we just have, yes. Okay, good. Oh, wait a minute before I let people in. Actually, I guess I should close the door since we'll have somebody breathing. Hello. Oh, that was loud. You look comfortable. Yeah, man. I miss. I miss. I miss. Forty minutes. You miss what? Oh, over his class. I fell asleep. Uh, I fell because I fell asleep in his Teddy's class. <laughs> I wasn't trying to take that long, but it it always happens if I take a nap. <laughs> uh, hey, Miss McQuillan. Hi. Um, my thing is frozen. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, my canvas has been messing up since Friday. And so was my email. I haven't been able to turn in stuff for my classes. So, yeah. So, like, I've been trying to, like, uh, that, uh, the questions for the poem, I've been trying to turn in since Friday. It's still, like, pending on, like, my email and my canvas. 
And uh, I emailed a uh, tech about it, and they're uh, we're setting up an appointment for so okay. what school Thursday. I don't okay. know, like it doesn't matter how much points I get off about it no more. I just want to get it turned in, and I won't be able to get that uh the analyze thing that's due today turned mm -hmm. in. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm not gonna hold it against you if you've just been having like tech issues and stuff because you can't really help that. And hopefully we can get that situated pretty quickly. Um, you know what though, while I'm thinking about it, since you weren't able to finish that, I'm going to put the PowerPoint that we looked at the other day on Canvas so that you'll be able to actually have the the stuff that you need to complete that. Um, where is it? Where is that thing? It's 11 o'clock. Thank you. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? It's this. Um, okay, I just went ahead and put that in. Um, like right underneath the settings thing. Okay, we have Alyssa, Alexis, we do not have. We have James in person, we have Genesis, we have LeBron, we have Cece, we have Kate in person, we have Zane and we have Randall. Okay, um, before we get started reading today, I want to go ahead and walk you through what you're doing tomorrow because I won't be here tomorrow. Um, if you guys are here in person, Mr. Cheek will be in here and I'll have a list of what to do. But I'll also email you and put it in announcements just so everybody is very clear on what they need to do. Um, but for you guys, I'm going to go ahead and post this. Ethan from analysis questions. And this is not a long, complicated, um, assignment but you've got four questions here and this is mostly from like chapters seven and eight um which is what we've just read we're starting chapter nine today um so four questions um why can chapter seven be considered the climax of the novel and when we get to the end you might not think that that is the climax of the novel but it can be um why do you think xena is so determined to get rid of her cousin maddie Contrast Zena's reaction to the broke, broken pickle dish and her decision to throw out her cousin Maddie. What does one have to do with the other? Um, and then for the other ones, you're looking at these. I actually think these page numbers are not at all correct. I might try to fix them before tomorrow, but just don't pay attention to these page numbers. But you've got a quote. Um, look back through, I believe these are, I believe. All of these quotes are from chapter seven. There might be one from chapter eight. Um, but look at the quote, tell me who's saying it and in what situation. And then what does that quote show us about the character? And you kind of do the similar thing before we actually started reading the book, just making predictions. But now you kind of know a lot more about it. So that's for tomorrow. I wanted to go ahead and kind of run you through it and let you know what you're doing. Um, but that's already posted on Canvas. Um, Wednesday, I won't see you because y'all are taking the wind test on Wednesday. So, um, so the next time I see you will be Thursday. Ms. McClellan, what is that test? I'm gonna be honest with you, Zane, I really have no idea. <laughs> I think it's like, um, it talks about what careers you'd be good at, but I, I'm not totally sure. Let me look it up because I'm curious. Um, it's an employment skills assessment system to measure workplace skills of employees and job applicants. All right. Um, so that'll that'll take up like, huh? Uh huh. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's. Why do you have to take any standardized tests? I don't know. Uh, and do we have standardized tests this year? You don't have, um, you don't have like 
end of course exams or anything. Um, unless you're in, well, you, you might in your social studies class, I'm not sure. Um, what class is that? In US not, history, we do. You do in US history, okay. Um, and I, I don't think you do in anything else. Science? Overheard that uh, Mr. Johnson might have an ELC. So, okay. What uh, what class do y'all have Johnson for? Is that chemistry? Biology. Biology. All right. You might you might have one for that. Um, the good thing is that you don't have anything for like. You don't have like pass ready tests or all those things that like middle schoolers have to do, and we're done in English with standardized tests. So um, other than like SAT or ACT, which I think everybody, I think all of y'all are taking one of those. Um, in fact, other than, I think Randall, didn't you take the ACT recently? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think you were one of like, five or six people who were taking that. And then, yeah, March 24th, all of the juniors minus Randall, David Green, Sarah O'Connor, and Hunter Crook are taking the SAT. Well, you said all juniors, or all like juniors and sophomores? All juniors. Yeah. Zane, are you a junior or a sophomore? Oh, okay. I'm a sophomore. Oh, okay. Sophomore? This one. You're just ahead of the game. Yeah, man. Kaboom. Uh, on that day, it'll just be you and me, so I'll probably just give you the day off. <laughs> All righty. All right, let's do some reading. We're starting the last chapter, and... The last chapter is kind of divided into two different sections. It's like the, the main plot, and then it goes back to the epilogue where it's like talking, it's the, the engineer who started it out. Um, but it's a pretty long chapter, so we're going to divide it up. Um, my goal today is to get through, we're starting on page 68. If y'all will notice, hang on, I'm going to share my screen. Boop, 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 boop. All right, so we're starting here at page 68. My goal is to get to the bottom of page 76. And hopefully we'll get that far. Uh, if we make it to that, I'm just gonna end it. I'm not gonna keep going just because um, big stuff starts happening after that and that's a good place to stop. But let's go ahead. Ooh. We read chapter eight um, at the end of chapter eight, he was like gonna ask the Hales for money and then he realized that they were so nice and had always been helpful to him and he didn't want to take advantage of them uh, in order to get his money. So he feels like he has no more hope for him and Maddie to be together. Anybody wanna read? Yes. Okie doke. At the kitchen door, Daniel Bryant Byron sat in the sleigh behind a big bone gray who pawed the snow and swung his long head restlessly from side to side. Ethan went into the kitchen and found his wife by the stove. Her head was wrapped in her shawl and she was reading a book called Kidney Troubles in Their Cure, on which she had to pay extra postage only for a few days before. Zena did not move or look up when he entered and after a moment he asked, where's Maddie? Without lifting her eyes from the page, she replied, I presume she's getting down her trunk. The blood rushed to his face. Getting down her trunk alone? Jotham Powell's down in the woodlot, and Daniel Bryant said he's, he doesn't leave the horse. He doesn't leave that horse, she returned. Her husband, without stopping to hear the end of the phrase, had left the kitchen and sprung upstairs. The door of Maddie's room was shut, and he wavered a moment on the landing. Matt, he said in a low voice, but there is no answer. He put his hand on the doorknob. He had never been in her room except once, 
in the early summer when he had gone there to plaster up a leak in the eaves, but he remembered exactly how everything had looked, the red and white quilt on her nor narrow bed, the pretty pin cushion on the chest of drawers, and over it, the enlarged photograph of her mother in oxidized frame with a bunch of dyed grasses at the back. Now these and all uh, other two. Mm. Tokens. Tokens of her pres presence had vanished and the room looked as bare and as comfortless as when Zena had shown her into it on the day of her arrival. In the middle of the floor stood her trunk and on the trunk she sat in her Sunday dress, her back turned to the door and her face in her hands. She had not heard Ethan's call because she was sobbing and she did not hear his step till he stood close behind her and laid his hands on her shoulder. Matt, oh, don't, oh, Matt. She started lifting, she started up lifting her wet face to his. Ethan, I thought I wasn't ever going to see you again. He took her in his arms pressing her close with and with a trembling hand smoothed her away the hair from her forehead not see me again what do you mean Jotham said she sobbed out Jotham said you told him he, he we wasn't to wait dinner for you and I thought you thought I meant to cut it he finished for her grimly she clung to him without answering and he laid his lips on her hair which was soft yet springy like certain mosses on warm slopes and he and had the faint woody fragrance of a fresh sawdust in the sun. Through the door, they heard Zena's voice calling out from below. Dan O'Brien says you better hurry up if you want him to take that trunk. They drew apart with stricken faces. Words of resistance rushed to Ethan's lips and died there. Maddie found her handkerchief and dried her eyes. Then bending now, she took hold of the handle of the trunk. Ethan put her aside. You let go, Matt, he ordered her. She answered, it takes two cokes it takes two to coax it around the corner and submitting to this argument he grasped the other handle and together they maneuvered the heavy trunk out to the landing now let go he repeated and he shouldered the trunk and carried it down st the stairs and across the passage to the kitchen Zena, who had gone back to her seat by the stove did not lift her head from her book as he passed maddie followed him out the door and helped and helped him to lift the trunk into the back of the sleigh when it was in place, they stood side by side on the doorstep watching Daniel Bryan plunge off his fidgety horse. Uh, there we go. It seemed to Ethan that his heart was bound with cords, which an unseen hand was tightening with every tick of the clock. Twice he opened his lips to speak to Maddie and found no breath. At length, as she returned, as she turned to re-enter the house, he laid a detaining hand on her. I'm going to drive you over, Matt, he whispered. She murmured back, I think Zena wants I should go with Jotham. I'm going to drive you over, he repeated, and she went into the kitchen without answering. At din dinner, Ethan could not eat. If he lifted his eyes, they rested on Zena's pinched face, and the corners of her straight lips seemed to quiver away into a smile. She ate well, declaring that the mild weather made her feel better, and pressed a second helping of beans on Jotham pa Powell, who wa whose wants she generally ignored. Maddie, when the meal was over, went about her usual task of clearing the table and washing up the dishes. Zena, after feeding the cat, had returned to her rocking chair by the stove, and Jotham Powell, who always lingered less, reluctantly pushed back his chair and moved toward the door. On the threshold, he he turned back to Ethan. He turned to back to say to Ethan, "What time I'll come around for Maddie?" Ethan was standing near the window. And mechanically filling his pipe while he watched Maddie to move to and from. He answered, you needn't come around. I'm going to drive her over myself. He saw the rise of color in Maddie's averted cheek and the quick lifting of Zena's head. I want you to, sh I want you should stay here this afternoon, Ethan, his wife said. Jotham can drive Maddie over. Maddie flung an imploring glance at him, but he repeated curtly, I'm going to drive her over myself. Zena continued in the same even tone. I wanted you should stay and fix up that stove in Maddie's room before the girl gets here. It ain't been drawing right for now for night oh on a month. What? Okay. It ain't <laughs> been drawing right for a night. No, on a month. It's like on nearly a month. month. Okay. Just for that about made me have a stroke trying to read. <laughs> Ethan's voice r rose indignantly. If it was good enough for Maddie, I guess it's good enough for a hired girl. 
But I feel like these are the power moves we were talking about. Like he's finally, it, it's the last possible moment that he's finally like standing up for himself and Maddie a little bit. Like, I'm not, I'm going to be the one to take her. Like if somebody's going to take her, it's going to be me, no matter what you say. And she does try to kind of like manipulate him into say like, oh, I, I want you to stay here tonight. And he's basically like, I don't care what you want. I'm driving her over. And then like, I think it has a pretty good point there. She must really hate Maddie at this point because if the if the stove in her room has not been working for like a month and she's just now fixing it, I think it's a fair thing to say if it was good enough for Maddie, it's probably good enough for a hired girl. But we let Maddie freeze to death in her room. And I think it'll be fine to let this other girl freeze to death. Like he's he's at least being more assertive and like not letting her walk all over him which i think is a little too late but i appreciate it anyway that girl that's come and told me she was used to a house where they had a furnace zena persisted with the same much monotonous mildness she had she better have stayed there then he flung back at her and turning to maddie he added in a hard voice you be ready by three matt i've got business at corbury jotham had started for the barn and ethan strode down after him aflame with anger the pulses in his temples throbbed and a fog was in his eyes he went about his task without knowing what force directed him or whose hands and feet were fulfilling its orders it was not till he let out the sore on back be- backed him between the shaft of the slave that he once more became conscious of what he was doing as he passed the bridle over the horse's head and wound the traces around the uh, around the shaft he remembered the day when he had made the same preparations in order to drive over and meet his wife's cousins at the flats it was little more than a year ago and on such on just a on just such a soft afternoon with the feel of spring in the air the sorrel turning the same big, big ringed eye on him nestled the palm of his hand and in the same way and one by one all the days between rose up and stood before him he flung the bearskin into the sleigh and climbed to the seat and drove up to the house when he entered the kitchen it was empty but maddie's bag and shawl lay ready by the door he went to the foot of the stairs and listened no sound reached him from above but presently he thought he heard someone moving about in his deserted study and pushing open the door he saw maddie in her hat and jacket standing with her back to him near the table she started at his approach and turning quickly is it time what are you doing here matt he asked her she looked at him timidly i was just looking taking a look around that's all she answered with a wavering smile they went back into the kitchen without speaking speaking and Ethan picked up her bag and shawl. Where's Zena? he asked. She went upstairs right after dinner. She said she had those shooting pains again and didn't want to be disturbed. Did she, didn't she say goodbye to you? No, that was all she said. Oh, didn't even say goodbye to her? Zena is mm-hmm. so petty sometimes. Rude. Ethan, looking slowly about the kitchen, said to himself with a shudder that in a few hours he would be returning to it alone. Then the sense of unreality be- overcame him once more, and he could not bring himself to believe that Maddie stood there for the last time before him. Come on, he said almost gaily, opening the door and putting her bag into the sleigh. He sprang to his seat and bent over to the tuck up the- bent over to tuck the rug about her as she slipped into the place at-, at his side. Now then, go long, he said, with the shake of the reins, and that sent the sorrel placidly jogging down the hill. We've got lots of time for a good ride, Matt, he cried, seeking her hand beneath the fur and pressing it in his. His face tingled and he felt dizzy as if he had stopped in at the Sparks Starkfield Saloon on a zero day for a drink. At the gate, instead of making for Starkfield, he turned the sorrel to the right up the Bettsbridge Road. Maddie sat silently, silent, giving no sign of surprise. But after a moment, she said, are you going round by Shadow Pond? He laughed and answered, I knew you'd know. She drew closer under the bearskin so that oh, looking. So sorry. S- oh, sorry. Oh, how am I doing this? Jesus. Uh. She drew closer under the bearskin so that looking sideways around his coat sleeve, he could just catch the tip of her nose and a blown brown wave of hair. 
They drove slowly up the road between fields glistening under the pale sun and then bent to the right down a lane edged with spruce and larch. Ahead of them, a long way off, a range of hills stained by mottlings of black forest flowed away in round white curves against the sky. The lane passed into a pine wood with bulls reddening in the afternoon sun and delicate blue shadows on the snow. As they entered it, felt it the as they entered it, the breeze filled fell and a warm stillness seemed to drop from the branches with the dro dropping needles. Here the snow was so pure that the tiny cracks of what animals had left it left on it intricate lace-like patterns and the bluish cones cut in its surface stood out like ornaments of bronze. Ethan drove on in silence till they reached a part of the wood where pines were more widely spaced and then he drew up and helped Maddie to get out of the sleigh. They passed between the aromatic trunks, the snow breaking crisply under their feet till they came to a small sheet of water with steep wooded sides. Across its frozen surface, from the farther bank, a single hill rising against the western sun through the long conical shadow which gave the lake its name. It was a shy secret spot full of the same dumb melancholy that Ethan felt in his heart. He looked up. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to point out, I know that they mean, like when they say dumb melancholy, they mean like you can't put words to it. Like people who can't speak are dumb, but I think it sounds so funny, just especially given like how much we don't really care for Ethan. <laughs> it's like full of the same dumb melancholy that Ethan felt in his heart. Like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. who's we in this situation? What, LeBron? Uh, all of us. We, all of us. I actually pity the guy. Well, not right. <laughs> I don't get it, but okay. The only one, LeBron. <laughs> yes, I'm the odd man out. Eesh. As per usual. <laughs> yeah, as, as usual. Yes, I'm the one that can look at the dam and... It actually feels sorry for them. How? Like I, I don't not, but like I, I have some sympathy for him, but not enough. Like not not enough to excuse all the dumb stuff he's done and all the bad moves he's made. Like I still don't think he is a super. Hey, listen, character. you can see, like you can pity the dam as much as you want. However, you can't take their side. They set, right. them up, they set themselves up like that's a very good sit there and way. be like oh I'm so sorry you're in this situation that you put yourself in yes and you're exactly. the only person who could stop it and you could if you wanted to but However, you didn't or not <laughs> exactly like, I one bad one. for him in that like he feels so stuck in his life and like a few things were beyond his control. He couldn't help that his parents got sick. But like once they died, he didn't have to stay there. He didn't have to stay with Xena. He could have gone back to school and he chose not to. So he like as bad as he feels about his own situation, he didn't do much to try to get out of it. And not only that, but literally at any point in this time, he could have left her. Men in this time, divorce is frowned upon. But if it's a guy, it you know, they're yeah. going to be like, oh, yeah, I got divorced, you know? Like, yeah. nobody's going to care. It's the white man, okay? <laughs> yeah, agreed. And I kind of feel like he almost, it's not like he likes feeling sorry for himself, but I feel like maybe a certain degree of it is just him being, like, comfortable in his life. Because I feel like he keeps kind of making excuses. And it's not that... Like, I get what he's saying, that he can't afford to leave her. Like, he doesn't want to leave her destitute, but he also doesn't have the money to, like, leave her or, like, start over somewhere else. But at the same time, like, how many, like, I feel like it's just excuse after excuse after excuse. And eventually, like, if, if you cared that much, I feel like you'd take the leap anyway. I don't Not know. Not only that, but, like... Not only that, but you have to also consider a little bit into, not only is it taking pity on the dam, but it's taking pity on the dam idiotic, okay? Because yeah. 
he's sitting here and he's like oh yeah i could leave her and let's be honest if he really wanted to he could go in out and get the financials like back in that day you make as much as you work he could have gone out and worked and gotten more money to leave her and everything else like that but it's also a dumb part on maddie like you know she she She's sitting here and she's she's coaxing into it. At first, you know, she was Miss Dumb and Innocent, but now she's like sitting here being like, not a woman's advocate, I guess. Yeah, I mean, she, nothing is of her own choice. She's just like letting herself kind of be led along. And I like, I feel bad for her more than for anyone else because her decisions are being made for her. And that sucks. Yeah. So I guess you can take pity on the damned LeBron if you want. However, you got to look at everything that's placed before them as well. No. Yeah. However, you are damned to be pity as well if you believe in this. Okay. No. Oh. <laughs> I am one of the damned. For me, and this is just for don't, me. Don't, don't say it damn. like it's cool. Like, don't say it like it's cool, like you're proud of this. It is not a moment <laughs> to be proud of. We're all damned souls. Well, some more than I have three boyfriends, and I do not consider myself damned, okay? I would believe that you are more than just that. I think you are, how do I say? There are kind words above? that should not be said here. You're above it. You are you're part of the 1%. You're the uh, the odd man out in this situation, Alexis. If we're really being honest, you're not the damned, and that's cool. I feel like it's hard to say that we're all damned souls because I feel like that takes away our free will. Like I don't consider myself damned in any way because, like, even if I feel that way sometimes, I still have control over my future. Yeah, that is true. The future that like you decide. But yeah. also, if we're gonna look at it not uh, like okay in catholic religion like they baptize the baby when they're born or whatever but in like my mother's religion they believe that babies are born born like a pure slate or whatever so Mm -hmm. i think you really have to like make some personal decisions (laughs) that you could have avoided to become damned ah period let's put this in your head a true sin can never be forgiven nor forgotten. What even from is doing can never be forgiven or forgotten. I don't I pity him as, as you the way you think. Me atheist? <laughs> I am not an atheist. I believe in all. I think that Ethan, like I'm gonna put some realists on here, I'll, here, because now y'all bringing religion to it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring back some a little bit, little bit of realism. Um. I think that Ethan, even with the free will and everything, Ethan knows better. He's been doing this for what, 27, what, 10 years now? Yes. He's been married to her for like seven years, been doing this for 10 years. Yeah, no, Ethan knows better. And the fact that he's sitting here and acting like he doesn't know better, I'm not, I'm not having it. I can't have pity on somebody who doesn't, who knows better. And oh, just, oh, oh, you oh. Know? Well, a lot of that Good happens. Point. People that know better tend to forget it or just ignore it on purpose. Like, exactly, which is why you can't feel bad if they put themselves in a situation because they ignored it themselves. Okay, wait, another good point is that we are literally, like LeBron, like we're kids. He is a grown 45-year-old man adult. 27. 27. <laughs> I don't care. 45 <laughs> men adult. He's still a grown adult. man, though. He's still a grown man. Yeah, and he's doing like he's childish like adult, things. You know, he's obviously like you. If we were to go back in this time, like LeBron, I'm pretty sure you would make the decisions. But also, he has like what, like ten years on you of maturity to make the right decision. He's he has making, what, seven years of marriage to make the right decision. And he's he making just, impulse decisions when your impulse decisions stop at 25. That's what he's doing. All your impulse decisions stop at 25 because your brain has already fully grown. And if this was the so hold up. To live, if he wanted to live does the life age of an equal adulter, to maturity? Done this, like, age, equals, age does equal to maturity because oh, of the brain. 
Yes, it does. It equals to maturity. Your brain grows as you grow. It stops growing at 25. You can learn new things I mean, all you want. Grow slower. Yeah, but- th- I mean, that part is true. Your brain is fully developed at 25. It might even be 24, but... I, don't, I wouldn't say you stop making impulse decisions. Like, there, most impulse de- decisions do stop at <laughs> once your brain is like developed. Not all of them, but like most like like weird decisions usually yeah. like stop. And what he's doing is I making to weird decide decisions. Decide to cheat on your wife. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Those like decisions. Your, your big life decisions you're not going to make as impulsively. Exactly. And yeah. what he is doing is making impulse decisions that should have stopped two years ago he's acting like a child at this point i want to say one more thing i don't want to keep going um i feel like this is very first of all james are you awake okay (laughs) um i i just want to point out i feel like it's hard for us to relate to this really strongly because both my generation and your generation are like more about living for yourself and like making the decisions you want and free will and not just Ethan's character but like realist literature and this time period was a lot less of that mindset and they were a lot more like everything's being dictated for me and like my environment's controlling me my family's controlling me that like you just didn't make a lot of decisions on your own and I feel like we want to say well just just think for yourself what's the big deal but it just, that's just not the way it was at this time period. So it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to relate to sometimes. Let's keep reading though. We've got like 17 minutes left. I want to make sure we get through this. He looked up and down the little pebbly beach till his eyes lit on a fallen tree trunk, half submerged in the snow. There's where we sat at the picnic, he reminded her. The entertainment of which he spoke was one of the few that they had taken part in together, a church picnic, which on a long afternoon of the preceding summer had filled the retired place with Mary making. Maddie had begged him to go with her, but he had refused. Then towards sunset coming down from the mountain where he had been felling, felling, like cutting it, cutting it down. Yeah felling timber he had been caught by some strayed revelers and drawn into the group up by the lake where maddie encircled by facious youths and bright as blackberry under her spreading hat was brewing coffee over a gypsy fire what are these words (laughs) it's insane but it sounds like a fun time i'm not gonna lie (laughs) he remembered the shyness he had felt at approaching her in his uncouth cloth clothes and then the lighting up of her face and the way she had broken through the group to come to him with the cup in her hand they had sat for a few minutes on the fallen log by the pond and she had missed her gold locket and set the young men searching for it and it was ethan who had spied it in the moss that was all but all their intercourse had been made up of such inarticulate flashes when they seemed to come suddenly upon happiness as if they had surprised a butterfly in the winter woods. It was right here. It was right there. I found your locket. He said, pushing his foot into a dense tuft of blueberry bushes. I never saw anybody with sharp, such sharp eyes. She answered. She sat down on the tree trunk in the sun and he sat down beside her. You're as pretty as a picture in that pink hat. He said, she laughed with pleasure. Oh, I guess it was the hat. She rejoined. They had never been avowed in their inclination so openly, and Ethan for a moment had the illusion that he was a free man, wooing the girl he meant to marry. He had looked he looked at her hair and longed to touch it again and to tell her that it smelled of the woods, but he had never learned to say such things. I think it's kind of funny that he's like, this is the most open we've ever been about our feelings, and all they really said was like, oh, you looked really pretty in that hat, and she's like, oh, uh, yeah, I guess it was the hat. Like, it's not really, it's not like they're openly confessing their love, but this is as much as they can do. Suddenly she rose to her feet and said, we mustn't stay here any longer. He continued to gaze at her vaguely, only half roused from his dream. There's plenty of time, he answered. They stood looking at each other as if the eyes of each were straining and straining to absorb and hold the fast the other's image. They were 
things he had to say to her before they parted, but he could not say them in that place of summer memories. And he turned and followed her in silence to the sleigh. As they drove away, the sun sank behind the hill and the pine boles from red turned from red to gray. By a devious track between the fields, they wound back to the Starkfield Road. Under the open sky, the light was still clear with the reflection of cold red on the eastern hills. The clumps of trees and then snow seemed to drag together in ruffled lumps like birds with their heads under their wings, and the sky as it paled rose higher, leaving the earth more alone. As they turned into Starkfield, into the Starkfield Road, Ethan said, Matt, why do you, what do you mean to do? She did not answer at once, but at length she said, I'll try to get a place in a storm. You know you can't do it. The bad air and the standing all day nearly killed you before. I'm a lot stronger than I was before I came to Starkfield, and now you're going to throw all, away all the good it's done you. There seemed to be no answer to this again, and again they drove on for a while without speaking. With every yard of the way, some spot where they had stood and laughed together or been silent clutched at Ethan and dragged him back isn't there any of your father's folks could help you there isn't any of them I'd ask he lowered his voice to say you know there's nothing I wouldn't do for you if I could I know there isn't but I can't she was silent but he still felt he felt a slight tremor in his shoulder against his in the shoulder against his Oh, Matt, he broke out. If I could have gone with you now, I'd have done it. She turned to him, pulling a scrap of paper from her breast. Ethan, I found this, she stammered. Even in the failing light, he saw it was a le the letter to his wife that had he had begun the night before and had forgotten to destroy him. Through his astonishment, there ran a fierce thrill of joy. Matt, he cried, if I could have done it, would you? Oh, Ethan, Ethan, what's the use? With a sudden movement, she tore the letter into shreds and sent the fluttering into the snow. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> tell me, Matt, tell me, he adjured her. She was silent for a moment and then she said in such a low tone that he had to stoop to his head to hear her. I used to think of it sometimes, summer nights when the moon was so bright I couldn't sleep. Just wanted to point out that this letter he's talking about, he had like started writing a letter to Zena to let him know let her know that he was planning to leave her and this is what maddie found and she she ripped it up but it also kind of opens the doorway for them to like actually have a conversation about this where he's he's like if i could have left would you have wanted that would you have wanted to be with me and this is really like the first time that they can talk about it really openly and clearly we thought for a while that they that she liked him back um, they did have that romantic moment before, but like she's telling us now that she she thought about them running away together and like she really had had feelings for him the whole time, which is quite sad. Oh my gosh, I would love to freaking just let you read this thing. Where did it go? Okay, okay. Uh, she was silent. I couldn't. Oh, start right here. No, yeah. Uh his heart reeled with the sweetness of it as long ago as that she answered as if the date had long been fixed for her the first time was that shadow pond was that why you gave me my coffee before the others i don't know did i i was dreadfully put on, out when you wouldn't go to the picnic with me and then when i saw you coming down the road i thought maybe you'd gone home the, that way on purpose and that made me glad they were silent again they had reached to the point where the road dipped to the hollow by Ethan's mill, and as they descended, the darkness descended back, descended with them, dropping down like a black veil from the heavy hemlock boughs. I'm tied in foot again, Matt. I'm, huh? I'm tied. Where am I getting ran? Okay. I'm tied hand and foot, Matt. There isn't a thing I can do, he began again. You must write to me sometimes, Ethan. Oh, what good old writing do? I want to put my hand out and touch you. I want to do for you and care for you. I want to be there when you're sick and when you're loathsome. You mustn't think, but what I'll do all right. What? You mustn't think, but what I'll do all right. You won't need me, you mean. Do without the word what in there. And it would make more sense. Like, you mustn't think but that I'll do all right. Like, yeah, just have hope, have faith in me that I'll, that I'll be okay. You won't need me. You mean, I suppose you'll marry. Oh, Ethan, she cried. 
I don't know how it is you make me feel, man. I'd almost rather have you dead than that. Oh, I wish I, what in the world is going I on know. here? Okay. <laughs> I don't think that's a nice thing to say. Like, I don't think that's a, that's a romantic thing to say. Like, I'd rather you were dead than be married to somebody else. I think that's an insane thing to say. But then she goes, oh, I wish I was. I wish I was. Like, I know. Yeah. They'd both rather be dead or, like, have each other be dead than not be able to be together. This sounds like a toxic relationship to me. The sound of her weeping shook him out of his dark anger, and he felt ashamed. Don't, don't let's talk that way. Oh my gosh, this writing is ridiculous. <laughs> Don't talk that way, he whispered. Why shouldn't we when it's true? I've been wishing it. Oh my gosh, I've been wishing it every minute of the day. Matt, you be quiet. Don't you say it. There's never anybody been good to me but you. Don't say that either when I can't lift a hand for you. Yes, but it's true, just the same. They had reached the top of the schoolhouse and Starkfield lay below them in the twilight. A cutter mounting the road from the village passed them by a joyous flutter of bells, and they straightened themselves and looked ahead with rigid faces. Along the main street, lights had begun to shine from the house fronts, and stray figures were turning in here and there at the gates. Ethan, with the touch of his whip, roused the swirl to a languid trot. As they drew near the end of the village, the cries of children reached them and they saw a knot of boys with sleds behind them, scattering across the open space before the church. I guess it'll be their last coast for a day or two, Ethan said, looking up at the mild sky. She was silent and he added, we were to have gone down last night. Still, she did not speak and prompted by an obscure desire to help himself and her through their miserable last hour, he went on dis. Cur cur discursively mm -hmm. ain't it funny when ain't it funny we haven't been down together but just that once last winter she answered it wasn't often i go down to the village that's so he said they had reached the crest of the corbury road and between the in in distinct white glimmer of the church and the black curtain of the barnum spruces the slope stretched away and below them without a sled on its length some erratic impulse prompted Ethan to say, how do you like me to take you down now? She forced a laugh. Why, there isn't time. There's all the time we want. Come along. He, his one desire now was to postpone the moment of turning the sorrel toward the flats. All right. And that's where we're going to stop today, which is perfect. We have like seven minutes of class left. So in order to put off parting with her he's like oh we all, we always said we were going to go sledding together let's go ahead and do that now uh which is a weird thing to do when you're kind of on a time crunch but you know he has talked the whole time about how good he is at sledding so um maybe he just wants to prove to her i know remember <laughs> like randall you said that was some weak game because he was just like oh i'm uh really good at sledding and i bet Dennis Edie's not as good as I am <laughs> and so I guess he's going to try to actually prove that to her um before we left the other day I asked you guys what you thought was going to happen in the end of this and there were definitely some mixed mixed opinions like he's gonna get played in some way Ethan was going to get played in some way um everybody was going to die that Maddie and Ethan were going to die, but Zena was going to live. Zena was going to die, but Ethan and Maddie were going to be able to live happily ever after together. That would be tragic if Maddie and Ethan died, but Zena didn't. I would be so angry. Oh that would kind gosh. of suck for everyone. How's she going to take care of herself? <laughs> uh, what do y'all? What do y'all think at this point? Is every has anybody's opinions changed? I still. You feel think. the story what about ethan or the story about what's going to happen in the end oh i'm still the same it's going to end like every other story like every other reality horrible i feel like i feel like gazina is going to die i don't know i just i just want her gone puppy oh i thought you know what i thought that was <laughs> what 
thought that was like a monkey for a second and I was about to be like Randall where did you get a monkey from <laughs> I would love it if you had a pet monkey oh my gosh dog, but that would be crazy Aww. imagine Randall with the pet monkey be so great i feel like they'd be best friends they'd be so cute <laughs> i feel like he'd be so attached to his little monkey friend and he would always like come on Zoom. randall if you had a pet monkey what would you name your pet monkey see because because <laughs> he ha- yeah you know what you would name your pet monkey don't even play like that you know you would well what do you think he would name his pet monkey <laughs> I think he would name his pet monkey something really stupid, like something <laughs> really goofy. Chai. Like you said, shy. Chi chai. Chi Yeah. See. <laughs> I think it'd be really funny to give a monkey like a very human name, like Stephen or Richard or Douglas or something. Just like very, very human. I'll be so good. Oh, bless you. Thank you. I want I want Zena to not exist in this universe anymore. That's what I want. I that's fair. Uh, I mean, like, ultimately, they could kind of be happy if Zena were out of the picture. Ultimately, and everybody would be happy because she's mean to everybody. Yeah, she is. There was like a very subtle line about how she was like seeing if Jotham Powell wanted seconds and it was like she normally didn't care what Jotham wanted or like she usually ignored his needs or whatever. And like that's kind of just this off the cuff thing to be like Zena's the worst and she's not usually nice to people. Yeah. She's not. I don't I don't want her in this universe anymore. No, me either. All right, well, I'm about to have to let you guys go. We've got like two minutes before the bell. Any last thoughts? Still pity the guy. Still pity the guy. Randall's pet monkey would be a great pet monkey. Would. That's my final thought. Okay, well, I will email you guys later, either tonight or in the morning, just to let you know, like, just to remind you of what you need to be doing um but i suppose i won't see you again until thursday at which time we will finish this freaking book and see how it ends and i can't wait there's actually so much foreshadowing and i've wanted to point it out the whole time but you guys don't know how it ends so i can't it's very frustrating Mm. (sighs) all right well see you thursday then okay bye Randall, I'm not here. To, I see your look of confusion. I'm not here tomorrow, and you guys are taking that test on Wednesday. So, I thought I did. Am I taking the test? Wednesday? The wind test. Everybody's taking it. Oh. Right? Hang on. Hang on. Let me check. Let me check. I have to take it off, right? You are not taking All juniors are taking it Wednesday the 10th. Okay. Yeah. All, All right. right. See ya. Hey, bye.